Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. I'm suing Karen, knowing it will destroy her family's finances. After that, how Mrs. Reliable got her jerk boss fired. And after that, we're going to court? Okay. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen gets sued. Will I get to meet Judge Judy? I love her so much. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. I'm suing Karen, knowing it will destroy her family's finances. Between the ages of 12 and 17, my mother was moving me from one psychologist or therapist to another, claiming they weren't a good fit for me. I found out years after that she was offering them cash under the table to tell her what I was saying and probe me on particular issues she had covered up to determine how much I knew or suspected. When they refused, she switched them. I found out a few years ago that the last guy she took me to, ages 15.5 onward, a psychiatrist she left me with for over a year, not only did take the extra money to tell her what I was sharing, which I already kind of knew, but the medication he put me on was at her request. There was no medical reason for me to be on any medication, and on top of that, the medication mix I was prescribed was a no-no to combine due to serious counteracting. The medication had a demonstrative, harmful effect on my general health, with side effects I still suffer to this day. I lawyered up, gathered overwhelming and indisputable proof, and started the legal process to sue the crap out of him. Realistically, we are looking at a mid to high seven-figure amount. A few weeks ago, he had a heart attack and passed. I ran into, or was ambushed by, his widow recently. She was remarkably collected, numb and informed me that she did not have the mental bandwidth to handle this lawsuit as she is grieving and taking care of the kids, two kids between the ages of 8 to 12 I believe, as he was the sole breadwinner. She also let me know that they did not have the ability to pay out the amount the lawsuit was probably settled for and she would have to drain college funds and sell their family house, cabin house and a place that houses her parents, leaving them, herself and the kids homeless. Five people. She begged me to accept a much lower settlement offer and not rob her kids of not only their father, but also their childhood home, all of their memories, and their future. Here's where I could be the jerk. I told her no, nothing else, looked her in her eyes, and just said no. From what my lawyer advised me, you do not engage in conversations with people you are legally opposing. I started walking away and she teared up, saying his heart attack was from the stress of the lawsuit, asking do I really want to punish the kids for what their father did. I told her, do not contact me again, and got out of the store. Knowing their situation, I'm now having a moral dilemma. Even at seven figures, I will not miss this amount, but I could do good with it. I have also lost my father young, so I know how devastating it would be to lose my home as well. But as much sympathy as I have for his family, it is on my torment he had built their life, and not just mine as we have discovered. My lawyer, fiancé, and family encourage me to let it play out. Am I the jerk if I don't settle for less? Edit. Won't his insurance cover this incident? Most medical malpractice policies do not cover liability that arises from criminal acts and inappropriate alteration of medical records, both of which he did and are included in the lawsuit, so his policy does not cover everything. Edit 2. Will you also sue your mother? There will probably be legal action taken as well against my mother, but for now, I'm taking one lawsuit at a time, as they are expensive and mentally draining. Suing the psychiatrist was much easier than suing my mother, so we started there. After this is done, we will explore options. Not the jerk. His familial wealth and ability to own all that he owned and create the college funds and the living situation his family has or had were partially built on his unethical behavior. He drew the benefits of his unethical actions, let them draw the consequences. If they have homeowner's insurance, and if he had malpractice insurance, some of those may help cover the settlement. The malpractice insurance may be able to wiggle itself out from any liability because it was doing something illegal, but other insurance may help. This is where it is important to follow through. Someone that profits off of criminal actions will usually hide behind, this money is for my family or kids or my mother. By letting them keep it, even if they've passed, it sets the standard as criminal actions are bad, but if you use the money nobly, you get to keep it. It's exactly this reason why as a society, we should take it back. You want potential criminals to know they will be worse off and the Faustian bargain won't work. That and their partners know the risk too. It's unfortunate for the family, but that's not OP's fault. Not the jerk. 
Their family home and cabin was paid for, at the very least, with your pain and illegal medicating, of which you're still suffering the repercussions of. And how many others did he hurt to save for his kid's college fund? Steady on and take care of yourself. Not the jerk. There's two options here. The first, she's telling the truth. Everything she says would happen. Here's the thing. Even if this is the case, you still deserve compensation for your suffering, both past and continued. Courts do not simply award seven-figure settlements like candy. Your experience was clearly horrific, and you deserve to be compensated. Put another way, the money and homes she and her family have at the moment were built on your suffering and that of other people like you. Option two, she's lying. What she's not telling you is that her in-laws have backup college funds for the kids. By homeless, she means she'll have to rent rather than own, and she might have to sell three properties, but she has enough other possessions that she can sell and buy a new home. I'm more likely to believe that this is the case, but she's lying because of this. She teared up, saying his heart attack was from the stress of the lawsuit. She's blaming you for trying to hold him accountable. She's saying that you trying to get justice for being medically mistreated was what ended her husband. She's telling you you've already ended her husband, so you owe her. She's trying to guilt you. Now, if she's telling the truth, she could easily have approached you through the correct channels and requested mediation or an out-of-court discussion where she put forth all of these details. The fact that she's trying to ambush you makes me think that if and when your lawyer looks at her and her family's financials, you'll find that there's a lot more to it than she told you, and she's trying to prevent that from happening. And that's without assuming that there's money hidden in offshore accounts, given the amount of money a person would need to have to own three properties plus full college funds for two kids, I wouldn't be surprised if this were the case either. Personally, I'd say go for the seven figures you're owed. If you're uncomfortable, ask your lawyer about the full details of her financials and if there are any other sources of money she may have that she doesn't want to disclose. In-laws who will take care of her and the kids, rich old relatives who will pass on and leave her huge inheritances, stuff like that. Make sure you know what her financials are based on the facts, not her woe is me story. And make a call once you have all the information, not just what she wanted you to know. Well, what do you think? Is Opie the jerk or not? Please let us know. I'd say go for two million to be honest. I can only imagine how many people's lives were negatively affected by that scumbag doctor. How Mrs. Reliable got her jerk boss fired. Background. I've been working the retail business for over 20 years and let me tell you, some of the managers they hire can do a better job, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Over the years of doing retail, I have established a reputation for myself. I'm Mrs. Reliable. Need somebody to come in? They call me. Need someone to stay late? They call me. Need to switch with someone because management said no for your day off? They call me. You can probably see where this story might be going. This story takes place a couple of years ago when I worked at a major grocery store in my town as a cashier. This story. This took place a couple of years ago back in 2020. I'm on my two years at this store and we went through so many people and managers it wasn't funny. Literally, it felt like we had a revolving door with how much turnover and employment we had. Getting back to the story, I was a cashier and the thing about me doing this job is that I have a tendency to be too good at my job. I was just hired to be a cashier. I was not a manager, nor a monitor, someone that is a step down from manager but doesn't have all the responsibilities of management, nor was I a customer service. However, I was trained for nearly all of the duties of someone who is. Need change? I went to cashier, got the money out of the draw, and went to grab the change that they needed. Need an override? I came over to see what the problem was and did the override. I did all of this on top of my cashier duties and self-checkout duties. Then Jerk came along. My manager at the time, let's call her Ashley. Ashley is the front end manager, meaning she's in charge of everything that goes on at the registers, cash office where all the money is, customer service and the self-checkouts. Now I liked Ashley. She was a really good boss and I liked working with her. Ashley had gotten pregnant and was expecting her second kid. I was excited for her. Unfortunately, when Ashley came back though, she was no longer going to be a manager, nor was she going to be full-time. She decided to come back as part-time. I can't really blame her though. You're working 40 hours a week and are not allowed any overtime whatsoever. Plus, you can be working as early as 5 a.m. to working as late as when the last customer decides to leave. Last time that happened, they didn't get out until 11.15 p.m. Enter Jerk. If you ever wonder what happened to that spoiled brat in school whose mommy never said no and always got what they wanted, that's Jerk. 
all grown up in a manager's position. Jerk was the type of manager that if he told you to do something, he expected you to do it without any questions. Have plans after work? Jerk expected you to whip out your phone right then and there, cancel your plans, and come into work. Have a doctor's appointment? Jerk expected you to cancel that appointment and then come into work. If you told him no, he would just say in the most condescending tone, well, I need you to anyway, and then just stand there scowling at you the whole time, basically trying to intimidate you by making you feel so uncomfortable by the staring until you cave. The setup. Now, I had my fair share of awful managers to the point where if I didn't need the money, I would have walked out right then and there and never returned. And I had my fair share of good managers. Jerk was somewhere in the middle, leaning more towards the walking out. Now, with me, I'll admit, over the years, I developed a sassy, sarcastic personality. I'm blunt, no filter, say what's on my mind, and I don't put up with people's BS. Apparently, Jerk never got the memo of my not taking people's BS. Around this time, summer was ending, meaning we were in the now hiring stage, and many positions were starting to open up in the store. Keep this in mind. What Jerk did to get me to start my pro revenge. Strike one. I had out of patient vein surgery done on one of my legs and I needed to take a few days off. Since I had a some vacation time saved up, I used my hours for those few days that I didn't have to worry so much about not getting paid. Jerk called me a day before I was supposed to come in asking if I can do a 9 to 1. I asked him three times over the phone, who's closing? Because originally, I was supposed to close that day until I got my approval for my days off. Jerk never answered me, so I just figured they had it covered. I come in, and of course halfway through my shift, Jerk calls me over and says that they don't have a closer. Keep in mind that I asked him three times over the phone who was closing. Jerk wanted me to clock out to go home for a few hours and then come to work and close. I said no, and then he tried the whole guilt tripping about not having anyone, and that we really needed you to do this. I said no, because one, I'm really tired and just came off surgery like three days ago. Two, I already made plans with my husband for the evening. Of course, Jerk didn't like this, because the next time I came to work, Jerk was just being petty and passive aggressive with me. Basically, he will either pretend that I'm not there, ignore me, or the transaction that he was doing was taking longer than it should, and then chastise me in front of the customers for taking too long to get to him. When I had my follow-up appointment with the vein doctor, Jerk asked me if I can come earlier. I told him no, I can't, because I have a doctor's appointment in the morning that day. Then he did as usual. Well, we need you to do it anyway, and started to do that staring with me. Unfortunately for him, I'm used to this when it came to Karen's and Kevin's trying to intimidate me because something didn't come right. I quickly shut that down by getting the other cashier's attention when they need help with something or quickly grabbed a customer's attention. When I came in after my appointment, Jerk, with a smug grin, very loudly in earshot of the bigwigs from corporate visiting that day. Well, OP, looks like you noticed that I didn't call you in because we didn't need you. I replied, good, because I wasn't able to come in early anyway. Strike two. Remember how I said that the store had openings? Well, turns out customer service needed some help, and the only way to get there was to ask your manager. So I went to Jerk and asked about being at the customer service desk. With everything that I've already been doing, I was basically the front-end assistant manager without the pay and title. Jerk said that he would get back to me, especially since I've been doing a great job. Two to three weeks later, I'm seeing people that I trained or have started months after I did getting promoted to customer service desk while I stayed as a cashier with all the other responsibilities piled on top. The customer service desk position would have easily been a 50 cent raise. The monitor position would have been a 75 cent raise. And of course, Jerk didn't want to pay more for doing the exact same things that I was already doing. I was starting to get the message of, why pay for the cow when the milk is free? Strike three. I was starting to look for another job at this point because I was getting sick and tired of how I was being treated, but I wanted to try and give this guy one last chance. So I found out that the seafood department in my store had an opening and I even talked to the seafood department manager, Debbie, about me possibly being in her department. He was ecstatic and was willing to work around my college schedule. I had to talk to my manager, Jerk, in order to get the transfer going. I talked to Jerk and he started to come up with any and all kinds of excuses to not have me transfer. I quickly shot that down and even the one where he tried to say that I can't because another coworker was transferring? First time I've heard of this. 
but the co-workers said they had no problem with me going. So I thought that was that, right? Wrong. Three to four weeks have passed and I've been getting nowhere with the whole transferring to the other department. Even Debbie was wondering why it was taking so long to get me to the seafood department and why the manager was dragging their feet with this. Turns out, Jerk blocked my transfer and they wound up hiring a new employee to the seafood department. Jerk thought that if there were no positions available and he can just deny my transfer, that I have no choice but to stay. After an argument between the two of us about this, because I was calling him out on his BS, Jerk said the magic words, Just do your job. Cue the malicious compliance. Just do my job? Okay. I was so glad that wearing a mask was required. Otherwise, Jerk might have seen my evil smile when I agreed to just do my job. Need an override? Sorry, but I'm not management, nor am I a monitor, so I can't do that. Let me go grab someone who can. Need change? Sorry, but I'm not management, nor am I a monitor, so I can't do that. Let me go grab someone who can. Jerk was at his wit's end and even tried to write me up for something. I quickly shut that down when I started to recite what being a cashier entails and what my actual job of being a cashier is. And I told him that if he wants me to continue with all of those responsibilities, that he needs to promote me so I can do all of those responsibilities. He quickly stepped back into being his passive aggressive behavior that I quickly shut down. I eventually found another job with better pay and better benefits and handed in my resignation of me leaving in 10 days. That jerk tried to deny and say, No, you have to give us two weeks notice. I quickly shut that down with a response. You wouldn't be giving us a two weeks notice if you were going to fire us or lay us off or let us go. Just a two minute warning. Cue the petty revenge. Now, you're probably wondering what could I have possibly done for the petty revenge, right? Well, there was an old saying. Never hurt the golden goose. Well, readers, what do you think happens to a department that is solely dependable on one person whose reputation is Mrs. Reliable? Need me to come in on my day off? Sorry, I can't. I have plans. Need me to stay late? Sorry, I already made plans. Someone called out? Sorry, I can't make it. I did this throughout my entire rest of my stay at that place. Jerk couldn't do anything about it either and it was starting to get to him on what happens when you rely heavily on someone else but treat them so badly that they actually decide to leave. Jerk's performance, because I wasn't there to cover himself, was starting to take a toll. He had to do so much now, of his own responsibilities, and there wasn't a thing he could do to me. He kept trying to be extra passive aggressive with me, to which I just smiled and waved and said goodbye to everyone but him. Now this wouldn't be a pro-revenge without the pro-revenge, after talking to a friend of mine about what happened when I worked there, he told me to report this to the district manager because that kind of behavior isn't good for the workplace. Cue the pro-revenge. I got the email address of the district manager from my friend and then I went back to the store as a customer. I kept in touch with a couple of my old coworkers and kept asking them how things were going and how's work going. None of them had a problem inventing to me on how bad things were getting with Jerk. I asked if they didn't mind if I put their name in the complaint or if they just wanted to be anonymous. A lot of them chose the latter. I whipped out my phone using the quick memo app that I had and I quickly wrote the notes in my phone, the date, and the register that the cashier was on at the time. I sent that email with the attached notes and with the entire account on my part as well to the district manager. Now, this wouldn't be pro-revenge if it just stopped there. I took it a step further. You see, with the receipts that we get, there is a survey on the bottom of every receipt and management kept trying to boost us to get customers to take the survey because it helped with the story front and all the points that the store gets. Well, here's the thing about the survey. When you fill out the survey, including the comments, everyone gets to see it. And I mean everyone. Jerk, the assistant store manager, the store manager, the regional manager, the district manager, and the representative of corporate get to all see it. So you can imagine what I did. Need a snack for school? Filled out the survey. Needed groceries? Filled out the survey. I filled out the survey every time, and I made sure to put everything that Jerk was doing on those surveys, including how he treated his employees. Three months after I left, the person they hired back in Sifu to make sure I couldn't go back there quit. Six months after I left, Jerk was nowhere to be found. A new manager took over for him, and no one seems to know what happened to Jerk. We're going to court? Okay. The setting, United States, northern neck of Virginia. The situation, bought land and built a house on it. 
Back when my wife and I were much more newlywed than we are now, we hired ourselves an architect and went whole hog on having our cozy little dream home designed. While this was being done, we went shopping around for a parcel of land on which to have it built, which went quickly and easily, and we even got a pretty nice deal on a half acre lot that was just far enough back in the sticks for us to be happy, but close enough to our jobs that it wasn't much of a commute. Best part of all? No homeowners association. There weren't any active back in that area because, point blank, it was full of poor people back there. Dirt poor country types and working poor wage slave types. We made very sure with our lawyer that no previous owner had ever had the title amended to allow for any HOA nonsense as well, because that's a thing some real estate developers like to do. They'll buy up a property, get the title amended to force the membership of that property into a local HOA that they usually operate or are in cahoots with those that do, and then resell it with that as a new requirement for any prospective buyer to automatically agree to when they sign the title. Flash forward to August of 2019. Lockdown was just around the corner, but nobody knew that yet. Everything was that which passes for normal out in those parts, and my wife and I had since moved to a different location, but retained that property as one of our various rentals. It was our dream home for several years, and we loved that place. Moving was tough. It was a good neighborhood out there, and folks were very welcoming. Then a company that's totally not named Ryan Homes or anything even slightly similar came in and spent some years buying everything up back there that got the market and pressuring folks into selling, which worked out for them only too well. And of course, they gentrified everything. For three years and some change, there was massive amounts of the old being torn down and hauled out and the new being built up and sold. The HOA was built right in because of course it was. Folks with money enough to throw down on poorly built houses that looked nice from the front moved in one by one and two by two. Property values in the area skyrocketed. Property taxes skyrocketed right along with them and more of the less poor people were forced to sell because they got taxed out of their own homes. My wife and I knew what was coming from the get-go. We knew these jerks from totally not Ryan Holmes were going to come sniffing around our way not to try to buy us out, but to see if they could threaten us into joining the HOA that they were installing. It was inevitable. Lots of information is public record. They knew we had money. They knew we were living below our means by two orders of magnitude. They knew we clearly meant to be exactly where we were because we sure didn't have to be. They knew they didn't have a chance of pricing us out on taxes, so they tried nagging us and coming right up to the line on harassment, always to talk to us about joining the HOA. They failed. They got told by one expensive lawyer to find something else to do before we all got super busy helping them find things to worry about, and so they desisted for some years. Then my wife and I moved and got the property set up as a rental. Absolutely not Ryan Holmes starts bothering our tenants there, both trying to get them to pressure us into putting the property into the HOA as well as getting our tenants riled up with the most outrageous lies about what could happen if we, the owners, don't protect our renters better. My wife and I were livid after hearing about this crap, and so we got a hold of definitely not Ryan Holmes to let them know that this was our formal request that they stop bothering our tenants and that all further communications would be from our really expensive lawyer. They must have assumed we were bluffing or maybe whoever was in charge of thinking that day didn't show up for work because they just kept right on with their nonsense. It got so bad that they were even sending fake but convincing looking envelopes with eviction notice that upon being opened said, could be what you find in your mailbox one day without our wondrous HOA and containing information about the benefits of the HOA. We gathered it all up and got the tenants to talk to our lawyer and got the police involved to get the ball rolling on a harassment investigation. Another formal request to cease and desist was sent to Ryan Holmes by the very expensive lawyer, which they utterly ignored. I think their guy that's supposed to come to work and think about things quit a long time ago. Maybe he never told anyone. Maybe nobody noticed. Whatever the situation on their end, when my lawyer talked to their lawyer, their lawyer told my lawyer that their client was doing everything legally and that if we wanted to pursue the matter in court, that was what we would have to do. So we did. I'm not sure what kind of lawyer magic my lawyer and his fellow legal demons worked on this front, but we were in court for one single hour when my lawyer and their four lawyers and the judge had a private talk about the preliminary hearing. Half hour later and the lawyers from Ryan Holmes comes back into court looking like a quartet of cats that had been ticked off. 
My lawyer takes his seat beside me and says, they're going to settle. And I was like, I didn't think we were that far along into this yet. What happened? And he said, they built 51 homes in a county of concern over two years. Every single one of them was inspected before close of a sale by a real estate agent that never actually got around to getting her home inspector license. And that's how it was that Ryan Holmes, the whole time, paid me 10 grand to not sue them while they got seriously did over by the county. I got 10 grand in the settlement, which my wife and I gave to the tenants in that property because they deserved it and we really didn't need it anyway. Am I the jerk for being brutally honest with my infertile sister-in-law? My younger brother has been with wife for about seven years, five dating, two married. In the early years, my husband and I put in a lot of effort to get to know her as my brother lived with us and she would be over almost every day. It just never happened. Even when my husband would drive her an hour out of the city to see her parents sometimes, he could barely get five words out of her. So we figured she was shy or didn't like us or whatever and eventually just stopped pushing. When we had our first kid, it was the same deal. The one time she was around our kid for the holidays, she just said she didn't really like kids and walked off, which is fine. They're our spawn. We don't expect others to like them, so we haven't pushed our kids on them. We still invited her and my brother to baby showers and birthdays and events. We have two kids now, but always made it clear they didn't have to come if it wasn't their thing, and they never did. My other brother and his husband are child-free, but love being uncles. They come around a lot. They spend a lot of time with our kids. It's great, and we are very lucky. Well, recently, my younger brother and sister-in-law started trying and learned that she is infertile. Obviously, I feel awful for them, as I can't imagine how it would feel. I reached out to my brother about how he wanted us to deal with things going forward, as I'm expecting again, and I didn't want to do anything or invite them to anything that would hurt, even though they never come. Well, my brother said they wanted invites and would be coming to things now. I was a bit surprised, but as he said, they did show up to my youngest's birthday party. It was a disaster. My sister-in-law would not stop nitpicking my husband and I and our kids. Our kids were too loud. I got the wrong food. They needed better manners. They needed better clothes. The kicker was when she kept trying to force my youngest to let her pick her up. She doesn't know her, so she didn't want her to pick her up. She went to my older brother's husband instead. My sister-in-law then declared, since my existing kids were brats, she would just be the godmother and best aunt to my expected one and that they, brother and his husband, could have the others. I told her flat out that my kids aren't brats. They just don't know her and she doesn't get to play house with my new baby and ignore my other kids under any circumstances if she wants to be an involved family member. She argued with me, so I also told her she had plenty of opportunities to be in our and the kids' lives and I don't like how she's suddenly bursting in and being rude and controlling. Obviously, I understand her recent fertility news is part of the reason she's acting like this, but I don't think that means she can't be held responsible for her words and actions or act like she's entitled to my kids. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I thought this was going somewhere very different regarding infertility, but infertility in no way excuses her behavior here. I agree. I am struggling with infertility and I would never even dream of acting this way. She's being rude and entitled, and I'd be worried about how she's going to treat the new baby if she thinks that the other kids are brats when it sounds like they're just acting like kids. Not the jerk. I don't think you were being brutally honest. You were simply setting boundaries and calling her out on her behavior like an adult should. You said absolutely the right thing. You need to be firm with her. Yes, infertility is hard. I'm now past the point where I could have had some kind of help to conceive. I've known since I was 18 that I would need help. Whatever she's finding difficult, that doesn't excuse her from minimum standards of behavior. You are so not the jerk. You are a gutsy mom. Entitled parents think I'm not normal because I'm not what they expected. And so they hate me. I, 26 female, come from an average South Asian family. Being born a female means you're either married with kids or still living with your parents at this age. I'm the latter. My parents have been told by my extended family that they're the best parents in the world because my extended family as adults are jerks basically. So my parents really take it to heart and are convinced that they are indeed the best parents in the world. I agree that they had gone through a rough time raising us. We're a group of five, three girls and two boys, so it couldn't have been easy. And we're all nice kids as well, but they're very concerned that we're not doing the conventional stereotypical South Asian kids thing 
like everyone else, so they believe they're still perfect. It's only that we're not normal. I'm the main target because I have my own life. I have never had a romantic relationship because I like being alone better. I didn't become a doctor like they wanted me to. I follow international relations and gender studies instead. Instead of kids, I have cats, whom I love like one would love their kids. Instead of getting a husband, I'm career focused and pursuing education. And worst of all, when they try to control and subjugate me, I fight back. When they compare me to others, I compare them with the parents of the person slash people they're comparing me to. I earn my own money and spend it on things I love, mostly my cats. I am a writer and I am a reader and I am a fighter. For them, all of this is just not normal. There's something wrong with me because I don't fit into the mold that they created and me not fitting in would essentially take their best parents title away. But my father doesn't speak to his kids like they're humans. I pointed out that I didn't like the way he speaks to me, so he said I was disrespectful. My mother likes to imagine I don't exist and pretends not to hear me. She has sharp ears to catch if it's something about them, but if I'm talking about a concern, she pretends not to hear me. But still, they believe they are the best parents in the world and that there's something inherently wrong with all of their kids. Edit. Wow, I wrote this out of sadness and frustration yesterday night and I woke up to see it as blown up. Thank you everyone for your kind words, but I think there's a few things to clarify. Sorry that I didn't mention clearly. 1. I do not have a degree in gender studies. I have a degree in social statistics which can get me a job anywhere else but here. I work as a math teacher. I'm interested in gender studies, but I went to a public university thanks to free education we have here and I was selected for social statistics and my university didn't let me study anything else. Selecting your majors isn't simple here, especially if college is free. Also, for free higher education, you need to pass your GCSEs with good results and I only did enough to get me into the social statistics degree. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.